First, he was a great nationalist. He, he really believed that India had a tremendous future and, and had a tremendous potential. He was a great believer in democracy. And at, at any time that he felt that democracy was being compromised, Nani was a crusader against that move or that development. We are living in perhaps the most momentous era in the history of the human race. India has 15.5% of the world's population and its income is 1.5% of the world income. It is an amazing combination of brilliant intellect, dazzlingly brilliant intellect, great legal knowledge, fantastic memory, and great persuasive powers in court. I would define this year's finance minister's effort as the presentation to the nation of a budget bouquet with a very few fresh flowers in front but with a lot of cheap greenery at the back sprayed with a soporific aroma and with a f quite a few stinging nettles which are not discernible to the superficial observer. During his speeches he never referred to his notes but the entire speech virtually was fixed in his mind, it was decided in his mind. Though the constitution forbids casteism, totally, yet I am sorry to say our Supreme Court by a majority of five to two brought it in. Why? Because they wanted to favor the so-called politicians, so-called leaders. Mm -hmm. and the, and I remember fighting that case for the months together. And I think I deserve to succeed. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to wait that long because I feel very impatient. I've tried to do what I could for this country. Nani Palkhewala, in my book, is, I think, perhaps the greatest advocate that I have known. In 1920, India was still under the British Raj. World War I had ended. The Swadeshi movement had just started. Gandhiji had begun his non-violent campaign for independence. On the 16th of January of that year in Bombay, a Parsi couple, Ardeshir and Sherbanu, were blessed with a son, Nanabai Ardeshir Palkewala. Theirs was a close-knit family. Nani, as he was known all his life, had an elder sister, Amy, and a younger brother, Behram. The family surname of Palkiwala was derived from the family business of manufacturing Palkis. But during that decade, the motor car had arrived, and so the Palkis went out of fashion. To make a living, Adishir bought a taxi and hired a driver who cheated him daily. Realizing he had to control the business, he bought himself a laundry on Warden Road, gave it a British name, Bailey an English name to attract the Europeans. But he charged the foreigner double for each shirt, four annas, or in today's terms, 25 paise. The family managed a modest middle-class standard of living. They stayed at Karekat Colony on Hughes Road, and then in a succession of homes in the Gwalior Tank and Nanachok areas of Bombay. From his early days, Nani played the violin even performing publicly at weddings as part of the Meli Kasinat band to augment the family income. He also helped the family by selling tickets to the tote of the Bombay race course. He was an outstanding student at school, had a passion for English literature and history. To this young man, no knowledge was alien. One day, he surprised Justice M.C. Chagla. As a young student, he came and wanted to meet my father, who had just become a judge, who was a member of the Senate. And he said that, I want permission to use the university library to read on literature and history. And my father was so impressed that a young man like that wanted permission to read. So he immediately gave him that permission. 
At St. Xavier's College, Bombay, Nani studied English literature. It was here that he met his future wife, Nergesh. They were married on 9th April 1945 at Bombay's Alblis Bagh and ultimately made their home at Commonwealth Building off Marine Drive, where they lived for the rest of their lives. Nergesh had studied law but never practiced it, but she supported him in every which way for over 50 years. At first he wanted to join the Indian Civil Service, but his father wanted him to become a lawyer. So he joined the Government Law College in Bombay and stood first in both the LLB exams. He passed the Advocates exam in 1944, standing first in every individual paper. In the same year, he began teaching at the Government Law College. He was such a fine teacher. He taught us Evidence Act, but he made it interesting but he held students well down. And from that day onwards, I realized that he is a great man. I remember vividly a budget speech delivered by a person I will not name. But the, at that time, the income tax rate maximum was 92%. And the budget speech says, with a view to leaving an incentive to the man who earns, 8% will remain with him. And on the CCI lawns, I called it an example of humor in a graveyard. Not only did we learn the law, but we learned lots of jokes from him. We had lots of fun in his classes. They used to be completely full. If you say it, it only means what was said about Irish politics, that if you are not confused, you are not well informed. <laughs> and if you are not confused about estate duty, you are not well informed. You only have to read the act to see for yourself how it works. Nani started his legal practice in the chambers of the formidable Sir Jamchidji Kanga, a leading lawyer and former Advocate General of Bombay. In a profession which is notorious for a long gestation period, this young lawyer's rise was truly meteoric. Within a short span of just three years, he had built up a huge practice. He worked 18 hours a day every day. Time was his worst enemy throughout his life. He never seemed to have enough of it. The chamber was crowded. There was Rustam Kola, Omi Sirvai, Maraswan Misri, K. H. Baba. So he had a table, Nani and his brother. But soon after, he got another chamber of his own. But before he got his chamber, he used to have conferences in his car. It is Dodge car, it was parked outside. He reduced every problem to a very simple proposition. He avoided technicalities, but he focused on the main principle. And I'll just give you one example. The government had said that uh, radio is not communication, and because of some tax concession which was given to communication industry. So we went to Mr. Palkewala, and he agreed to appear. And then he said that, what is communication? He said, according to the tax department, if I read a newspaper, that is not communication. Why? Because I, I, I can't shout back at the editor. So he said, communication is only, does not require two parties to, uh, except for telephone, nothing else will qualify. So he reduced it to a simple proposition and something which had come from the parliamentary estimate committee uh, was resolved in 10 minutes time. What propelled Nani's rise to fame as a leading tax lawyer was undoubtedly the publication of his book, The Law and Practice of Income Tax. Palkiwala was sued for violation of copyright. You see, his book on income tax came in 1950. There was an earlier book by Sampath Ayengar, which was the leading commentary on the subject. He found that number of passages in Kanga and Palkiwala, according to him, were plagiarized, were copied from his book. Nani, in his deposition, proved that he had gone to the original source, that is, the decided cases, for writing his commentary. Purely from memory, he referred to case after case, each time citing the name of the case and of the law report which carried it, the exact page number on which 
the judgment started and the page on which the relevant words in the judgment were to be found. Apart from his book on taxation, Nani wrote many others, some of which became bestsellers. Nani first came to public attention in 1958. This was because of the budget speeches he delivered under the auspices of the Forum of Free Enterprise. M. R. Pai, the secretary of the Forum, was responsible for bringing Nani to the notice of A.D. Shroff, the Forum's founder. During his various visits to many places in the country, he started to realize that poverty was not getting resolved. But he believed sternly that it was curable given the right mix of poverty. And instead of bringing the rich down, the need was to uplift the poor. And this caught his mind that the private enterprise or market economy was the best medium to do that. And simultaneously, he started his campaign about rationalizing the tax structure, bringing in more fairness and equity. And his relentless fight and his book, Highest Tax Nation, caught the attention not only of authors here, but many abroad. The first meeting was at the Old Greens Hotel, which was attended by 800 people. Nani joined the Forum's Council of Management and became its president in 1968, a position he held for 32 years. He resigned in 2000 because of failing health. The Forum then elected him as President Emeritus. The annual meeting became a national event. It was said that there were two budget speeches every year one by the finance minister, the other by Nani Palkiwala. The audience that began with just 800 people soon rose to 3,000, and by the 1990s, it grew to over a record-breaking 100,000, larger than any cricket test match at Bombay's Brabant Stadium. His speeches were full of amazing facts and figures, wit and punctuated with numerous quotations. In the year 88-89, the national debt in this sense will total 224,000 crores of rupees. It's a mind-boggling figure. It is the largest figure mentioned in any of the budget papers. 224,000 crores of rupees, that is 2 lakhs 24,000 crores of rupees, is the indebtedness of the government. On that, the government will pay interest, which will come to 14,100 crores of rupees. Now, 14,100 crores of rupees is almost one-third of the non-plan revenue expenditure of the government of India next year. That means you are paying by way of interest charges one-third of your non-plan expenditure. It is proposed that the government would borrow 27,000 more crores in 88-89. That means half of the borrowing would go merely to pay the interest charges. Please consider the figures again and have it clearly in your mind. New borrowing, fresh borrowing, 27,000 crores, of which 14,100 crores will go only to pay the interest charges. The government of India is acting as a compulsive borrower. There is a section in our Income Tax Act, numbered Section 80U. That section says that if a man is totally blind or he is substantially handicapped, like say loss of limbs or multiple sclerosis, unable to walk or unable to sit, then he will get a 15,000 rupees exemption in calculating his taxable income. Now they want to add to it those who are mentally retarded. Those who are mentally retarded can also claim the 15,000 rupees exemption. It's not a big sum. It's not a total exemption of your income, but up to 15,000 you get relief. Now I want to tell you what they have provided so that you can judge for yourself the mental caliber of the people who make the laws of this country. The provision says that the man before he can claim exemption, must be mentally retarded to an extent prescribed by the rules made by the Central Board of Direct Taxes. 
I can understand the provision which is already there. His mental retardation must be such that he is unable to be engaged in a gainful employment, period. That I follow. It's already there. But that's not enough. He must comply with the rules to be framed hereafter by the Central Board of Direct Taxes as to the extent of the mental retardation. Then number two, he must get a certificate from a psychiatrist in a government hospital that he complies with the extent of retardation prescribed by the rules. If these two conditions are fulfilled, if you ask me who is the psychiatrist in a government hospital in Bombay, I would not know. And I don't know how much time it, and how much trouble it would create somebody to have to first search for a government psychiatrist and then get a certificate. He would not have heard of the central board rules, so you have to produce the rule to him and tell him that do I comply with the rules or not. I've heard of tax evasion, but how many Indians do you think would brand themselves as mentally retarded to get an allowance of 15,000 rupees? To my mind, the begetter of this amendment and the draftsmen of the amendment are the prime candidates for benefit under the section. So, so much about the rationality of the budget. Lord Keynes used to say, men will do the rational thing but only after he has explored all other alternatives. <laughs> India explored for 30 years all alternatives and has ultimately decided to do the rational thing. You pass laws which need more and more bureaucrats. No wonder that a foreign observer once said that nothing moves in India except the river Ganges. His oratory was not confined to fiscal and legal matters. He spoke on a wide range of subjects, including spiritual and cultural matters. He was a great admirer of Swami Vivekananda, Aurobindo, and Sai Baba, whose philosophies greatly inspired him. Mr. Palkiwala was not a ritualist, but he believed in divine force. He wanted to live by the Dharma, by the other requirements which are expected from a spiritual person, from a religious person. You know, Nani was a person of great standing, uh, a great public figure, a person who could amass thousands of people at the CCI to give his budget talks. And yet he was someone, if, if he was confronted in the lobby of Bombay House by a sweeper, could could spend time listening to his problem and tell him to come to his office at another time. Nani's national fame as a Supreme Court lawyer came very early in his career. One indication of his uh, stupendous achievement is that he joined the bar in 1944 and by 1953, at the age of 33, he was arguing very important cases in the Supreme Court on his own, which I think is a almost unparalleled feat. Beginning with the Goloknath case in 1967, he fought a series of cases in the Supreme Court to defend the rights of citizens and preserve the sanctity of the Constitution. One of Nani's more important cases was R.C. Cooper versus the Union of India, popularly called the Bank Nationalization Case. On 19 July 1969, 14 banks with deposits exceeding 50 crore rupees were nationalized by the promulgation of an ordinance. The government replaced the ordinance with an act of parliament, and it was this act that was ultimately struck down by the Supreme Court in February 1970. Because it was Rustam Cooper who had prepared the whole case, and Balkewala did it over a period of time a great personal sacrifice because he believed that this sort of an expropriation should not stand. Of course, later it was, the defects were removed and nationalization went through. 
but that was one of the great cases which ultimately led to a super session less than a year later the supreme court delivered another major ruling on constitutional law in the privy purses case the court declared as unconstitutional the presidential order withdrawing the traditional grants to the princes by the government the maharajas were represented by mc setlwad mc chagla and by nani palkiwala the princes were given an assurance in writing which raja ji signed as the governor general of india where he said that you are guaranteed this privy purse and your descendants who act, who, uh, who uh, occupy the gadi are guaranteed that not only the government of india's guarantee under the signature of the governor general we put it in the constitution in article 291 we said the privy purse free of tax is guaranteed and shall be paid out of the consolidated fund of india it is the highest guarantee the highest assurance the greatest security known to our law to me as to raja ji it will it is only a matter of principle the real question is is it worth while dragging in the mire the good name of your country for the sake of four and a half crores of rupees which is a sum dwindling year after year as the maharajas die the powerful argument that nani delivered swung the nine members of the 11 judges to restore the privy purses to the princes this impressed the former governor general rajakopalachari he wrote to nani making fun of the attorney general's efforts to justify the government's endeavor and praised the supreme court but alas indira gandhi had the final say by overturning the supreme court's decision by the 26th amendment of the constitution 1971 the crowning glory of nani palkiwala's career was undoubtedly the case of ananda bharati case popularly known as the fundamental rights case in which it is said that his advocacy saved democracy in india it took its name from one of the petitioners swami kesavananda bharati the head of the edanir math in kerala in july 1971 the government introduced the 24th and 25th amendments to the constitution and parliament the 24th amendment sought to get over the decision of the supreme court in the golaknath case the 25th amendment is the amendment parliament will pass after the 24th amendment has become the law in other words after the 24th amendment is ratified by the state legislatures the 25th amendment is this first article 31 of the constitution will be amended a man's property can be taken away without payment of compensation he has only to be paid an amount now amount as any dictionary will tell you means a sum of money your property may be worth 1000 but it can be taken away for 100 rupees if your property is sought to be taken away you cannot claim even the right to be heard this is your free democracy for the first time the court consisted of a 13 judge bench including chief justice s m sikri in all as many as 93 lawyers took part in the deliberations which took 66 working days the highest number in the history of the supreme court nani argued that if the amending power is held to be unlimited then parliament could abolish the judiciary and the other organs of the state curtail the fundamental rights and convert democracy into dictatorship Amongst the many lawyers was his nephew Homi Ranina who recalls how they found the key to the argument in Delhi The issue which came up before the court was whether parliament has absolute power to amend abrogate the constitution One of the judges uh, made a stray mention that possibly uh, it cannot be amended uh, in certain respects and immediately uh, i think uh, it clicked with nani so as soon as the court rose at 1 pm in the afternoon for lunch he called me and said uh, why don't we just rush to the library which is as a library opposite the supreme court and do some research when can an amend uh, constitution not be amended there were no indian cases so i had to go through australian uh, canadian and other uh, court decisions and that is where this this one point came up 
that while the Constitution can be amended, Parliament has absolute power, but it cannot abrogate or amend the basic structure of the Constitution. And this fortunately was upheld by seven out of the 13 judges. So it was a seven to six split verdict. And that is what is now the law of the land. He went on to say that the basic structure included, among other features, a guarantee of basic human rights, a free and independent judiciary, and a balance between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Hearing of the case began. I believe almost all the 13 judges, people who were there to tell us, all the 13 judges were convinced that this is wrong and you cannot curtail the power of parliament. And I dare say it is only person as learned in the laws and as brilliant an advocate as Nani, who brought home to the judges, first of all, that a power to amend is not a power to destroy. And Parliament had rightly been given only the power to amend the Constitution. It illustrates his basic humanism, his interest in preserving civil liberties, his interest in seeing that people's freedoms are not curtailed, that the democracy survives in this country, that we have economic freedom. Everything goes with the concept of basic structure. This judgment was delivered in April 1973. And, uh, and two years later, in 1975, Indira Gandhi pronounced the emergency. Now, had this judgment not come, then she would have really been able to change the constitution to suit her requirement or whatever she wanted to do. Indira Gandhi then found herself in a determined legal assault from her political opponents. She was found guilty of election practices and banned from holding elective office for six years. Nani agreed to defend Indira Gandhi in court. His eloquent arguments before Justice Krishna Iyer of the Supreme Court resulted in a conditional stay which allowed her to continue as Prime Minister, but without the right to vote in Parliament. Her reply to the mounting violence was to declare a state of emergency, suspend Parliament, impose censorship, and arrest several leaders of the opposition and some dissidents of her own Congress party. Emergency was declared on the night of 25th, 26th June, 1975. Many opposition leaders were arrested in a midnight swoop, a step that sent shockwaves throughout the country and inspired a wave of protests which were brutally suppressed. Nani immediately returned Mrs. Gandhi's brief, as it was no longer consistent with his lifelong convictions and the values he cherished. And I wish she had not been ill-advised enough to impose the emergency, because the emergency was not called for. In fact, today the situation is much worse than it was in June 75 when the emergency was declared. It was a very brave decision indeed, considering the circumstances, but it was his integrity of conscience and fearlessness which was characteristic of the man. Nani had kept a low profile after returning Indira Gandhi's brief, but when Chief Justice A. N. Ray constituted a review bench of 13 judges in November 1975 to hear the case of Ananda Bharati judgment, he felt compelled to act. The hearing in the case lasted over two days, 10th and 11th November 1975, and was a crowning achievement of this advocate's superlative career. Nani's impassioned plea so moved the judges that Chief Justice Ray, an appointee of Mrs. Gandhi, was reduced to a minority of one. He had no option but to dissolve the bench, and since no decision was given, there is ironically no official record of the hearing. I was quite struck by his uh, intellectual sharpness, by his quick-wittedness, by the depth of his arguments, as well as his responses to questions which were posed to him by the, by the court, by the various judges. And Justice Khanna said so in one of his books or articles, that that was Nani's most brilliant performance. Justice H.R. Khanna told me that the heights of eloquence which Nani reached on that day have never been equaled in the Supreme Court. He said, it was not Nani who spoke, it was divinity speaking through him. It must have been more than just brilliant advocacy. It was Nani's pure spiritual energy, which he unleashed on the bench. 
and which shamed those judges into dissolving that bench. Sirvai, who was the lead counsel on the other side for the state of Karnataka, and a great lawyer and a great jurist himself, was highly critical of the judgment in Kesavananda Bharati. But after what he saw during the emergency and after what he observed in the arguments in the habeas corpus case, he gradually changed his view. And the final view which he expressed was that the decision of the Keshavananda Bharati, the basic structure doctrine, is the correct answer. It is not for nothing that Rajaji referred to him as God's gift to India. The Minerva Mills case was another of Nani's great triumphs in defending the Constitution. He argued that Article 31C violated the case of Ananda judgment, which held that any law which affected any basic structure of the Constitution was ultra-virus. And in the Minerva Mills case, he came and argued single-handedly and induced the majority of the court to strike down an amendment to Article 368 of the Constitution and also Article 31C. All this today, the constitutional situation which has preserved the powers of the judiciary in India is because of Nani's effort single-handedly. But this man for all seasons was more than just an extraordinary lawyer. He was also an outstanding business leader. In 1961, he was invited by the legendary J.R.D. Tata to join the House of Tata. Initially, his role was restricted to legal advice, but it soon expanded. He held top positions in Tata companies, Tisco and Telco, and went on to be J.R.D. Tata's right-hand man and confidant. Jay and Nani used to have offices across a, a common reception area in, in Bombay House, and they were back and forth between their offices, at least when I joined Tata's, they were in and out of each other's office all the time. He was never an operational businessman, never sought to be one either, but his ability to grasp a situation, understand the nuances of what one was talking about, and then put it in a almost crusader-like perspective, was where he shone the most in my recollection of him. Nari Palkiwala's name was synonymous with ACC, where he was chairman for nearly three decades. His annual chairman speech was an essay in education. In a few bold strokes, he would outline the contours of the economy and his vision for the company. One of his chairmanships was of the TCS committee of Tata Sons. FC Kohli, the director in charge of TCS, approached him. He made a significant contribution towards laying the foundation of this over $13 billion software giant. Today, TCS is not only the largest IT services company, but also the largest Indian company in terms of market capitalization. TCS had a lot of problem in the beginning. The government did not understand computers. You see, the earlier year when you have a zero business, and you are trying to grow in foreign lands, you need a lot of support. I had a faith in that I could build up something, and he had a faith in me. And it is because of that we could build it up. Whenever you went to see him, thoroughly read your memo, he had tried to understand it and all that. And his attitude was not asking questions. His attitude was how to help you. There are some who believe that this great lawyer could have made a greater contribution to the law had he not joined Tata's. My father was greatly disappointed that Nani chose the commercial world in preference to the law. Of course, he continued to practice the law, but there he was, the undisputed, uncrowned king of, of the legal profession, and he saw no reason why Nani should want to go to the world of commerce when he enjoyed this. Not that he would have been a greater lawyer, but his contribution to the law would have been that much greater. I always felt that Nani, first and foremost, was a corporate lawyer, a constitutional lawyer, a senior statesman. And being in the corporate world made him pick sides, take positions, which he would not have had to do had he remained as an independent lawyer.
Nani was offered the position of a Supreme Court judge and then the post of the Attorney General of India. But he refused both offers because he felt holding a public position would be a fetter, preventing him from championing the cause of democracy and upholding the rights of the citizen. He was, however, a member of the First and Second Law Commissions. In September 1977, when the Janta Party under Moraji Desai came into power, Nani was appointed India's ambassador to the United States of America. Mr. President, may I say this out of what you have said? I was listening to your magnificent speech in the United Nations on the 4th of this month, and I asked myself whether there was a single idea or principle which were adumbrated with which India would not agree. And I must say there was no such principle and no such idea. And I'm looking forward very keenly to the years ahead when I'm sure our two countries will get closer together and what you have called the largest democracy and what I may call the most powerful democracy in the world will become closer friends in the years ahead. And all the ideas, Mr. President, which you have been standing for, the moral values, are the ideas and the values to which we are deeply committed. I think you and I get along very well. <laughs> the most remarkable feature of his tenure was the personal rapport that he established with President Jimmy Carter and his mother Lillian. There was a controversial episode when Lillian Carter, who had lived and worked in India, expressed a liking for Indian chapels. The ambassador bent down to check the footwear. There was no controversy, and if the question arose today, I would do it over again, and not do it once, but 100 times over again, as I told Mr. Atal Biari Vashpai, who was the foreign minister. Mrs. Lillian Carter wanted some footwear from India, and and I bent down to see that the right size is obtained for her. She was an elderly lady, 80 years old. I would kneel down to any person who is above my age because this is Indian tradition. Universities conferred honorary doctorates on him, including Princeton and Lawrence Universities. The citation at Lawrence University cited Nani as India's leading author, scholar, teacher and practitioner of constitutional law defender of the individual, be a prince or a pauper, champion free speech and religious worship. And as president of the Forum for Free Enterprise, he had battled stifling economic controls and bureaucratic red tape. In the 18 months, he introduced India to the American people as no ambassador had ever done before. While in the US, Nani delivered more than 170 speeches, sometimes as many as three to four speeches in a single day. Money was full of compassion for the poor and gave away his money freely. He told me that he would like to make a donation to our institution. And he said that I would like to donate when I'm alive. There's no point in making a donation after I'm no more in the world. And keeping up his word, on the next visit he gave me the shares which he owned in several companies amounting to almost about 67 lakhs of rupees. He said, this is Sushankaranitralia. A year later, he said, I'm going to give you now all the bank savings which I have created so far. And he gave it in the form of a check. And the check was just waiting on his table. And all that he wanted to know was, what name should I write the check? Then we mentioned the name, he wrote the name, put it in an envelope and gave it to us. And we didn't have the telemetry to open the envelope and look at it right in his presence in his office. When we came out of his office and looked at the cheque, it was a whopping amount of two and a half crores of rupees, which is the exact amount of money which he had needed.
produce them. The view that it is far better for this country to be governed by a Lee Kuan Yew than by the pack of fools who masquerade as the leaders, uh, the politicians of this country. He was highly critical of both the way the government functioned as also the legal system, which he felt had made life too easy for criminals and too difficult for law-abiding citizens. The older I grow, and I'm now coming to the end of my life, I'm now getting to understand why Jai Prakash Narayan said that what is, ne what is needed in India is a total revolution. He meant a total revolution in our thinking. We cannot keep on going this way and without great detriment to our nation. And just as China has become more powerful as a result of total revolution, maybe the future may show that India needs a kind of a total revolution, at least in its thinking, if not on the political level. In 1991, Nani had a coronary bypass operation, and yet he kept up a punishing schedule. In 1999, the crusader was fully paralyzed on his left side, but still welcomed visitors to his apartment. But then a second blow came. His great pillar of strength, his wife Nergish, also fell ill and passed away on June 4, 2000. The man who had fought for the rights of the people of India was shattered. It was as if he had lost his will to live. Finally, on 7 December 2002, the old campaigner suffered a massive cardiac arrest just as he was entering the hospital. He slipped into a coma. The man who had been the conscience of the nation, an ever vigilant trustee of human values, passed away four days later, on 11 December, at 5.15 in the evening. There were many posthumous honors. The chowk outside Bombay House, where he had worked for so many decades, was named in his memory. A stamp in his honor was issued and released by the then Prime Minister, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Several tributes were paid to this great son of India. He inspired and educated a whole generation of Indians. He taught us that we have to speak loud and clear for the values which our vision and our personality require us to speak about. He also taught us that uh, there were two types of laws and rules of personal conduct. One were those which were enforceable and then there were those which were not enforceable. And he said the true test of character was adherence to those rules which were not enforceable. From 66, he has single-handedly protected the constitution, Golaknath, bank nationalization, three purses, and Kesan Bharati. It was almost like a one-man army against the onslaught on the constitution of India. And believe me, if you see the kind of amendments that were made in the emergency, but for Kesanan Bharati and but for basic structure, we may not have remained as a democracy. But perhaps the best and most succinct was the one paid by his lifelong friend, Nana Chudasama, in his banner on Marine Drive. We the nation, we the people, have lost a legend. It is said in the Zoroastrian Gatha, these things are clear to the man of insight. He who upholds truth with all the might of his power, he who upholds truth to the utmost in his word and deed, he indeed is thy most valued helper, O Ahura Mazda. The Constitution is not intended only for you and for me. It is intended to give such a momentum to the living principles of the rule of law that democracy and civil liberty may survive in India beyond our own times and in the days when our place will know us no more. 
This is the future, the unfolding future of our great constitution.